What is worship and how is it connected to the presence of the Lord? God will not release you into the ministry until you are faithful with your family. Because some people are wondering, why are you doing that, Phil? We almost got beat to death in the gay district in San Francisco. So marriage, it teaches you a lot about your relationship with Jesus. You know, behind every great man is a powerful woman of God. I don't agree with that statement. Worship music and show business. Uh, where do we draw the line? The point of music is to reveal Jesus. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome back to our Way of the Lord YouTube channel. Um, it's good to have you guys back. Um, today, we have a very, very special guest with us. Preacher, evangelist, uh, songwriter, worship leader, Philip Renner. Uh, it's so good to have you with us today. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. It's going to be legit. I'm excited. Yes, we're going we're gonna to go into some uh, interesting questions. We're going to just enjoy the conversation. Let's go. Take me there. Yeah. Let's go deep. So, Let's okay. go to the forbidden right, waters. Right off the bat, we're going to go into first question to you. Who is Jesus to Philip Renner? You know, the scripture that I was quoting this morning, I believe it's Isaiah 6, 9. What it says is that unto us a child is born and the government is held on his shoulders. Mm -hmm. He is counselor. He is mighty, everlasting father, prince of peace, yeah. Emmanuel. God is with us. And really to answer that question, I mean, Jesus is everything. He's the point of life. There's no reason to live except to live for him. Um, the only way that you're going to get so to speak, for lack of a better word, like a, a high out of life. Like, man, this is awesome. That's so good. Is when you're in love yeah. with Jesus. Yes, come on. And a lot of times being in love with Jesus means that you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen today, what the day looks like. And I was actually talking about that with some pastors today. Mm -hmm. And um, it's the mystery. It's the mystery of knowing Christ. Like, how deep are we going to go? What are you going to teach me today? But he's the source of life. He's everything. To you personally. And there's no point in living without him. Mm -hmm. One thing that I, I tell to every single couple that we're counseling in marriage, or if it's somebody who's a youth pastor or a pastor, every single walk of life. I say that God is the center of your life. He is the glue in your yeah. life. And because he is the glue, everything comes together. Yeah. When you take him out of the centerpiece, everything falls apart. Yeah. So he is the glue that holds everything together. He's the reason for living. He's the reason why I lift my hands and I say, holy, 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 mm -hmm. holy is the Lord God Almighty. Mm -hmm. And that's the way every single day starts. Yeah, that's good. Is realizing who he is. Because when you realize who he is, then you can truly go into a place of rest and him leading and guiding you through yeah. the day. Yeah. So that's really good, really good. Um, how about when did your journey with Jesus start? I know you were raised in Christian family. I was raised in a Christian family. But... In my life, there came a point where I was, I said, Jesus, now this is when I, where I dedicate my life to you. So w did you have that moment or you were just, or you just kind of, was it, what kind of experience was it? I definitely had that moment. And of course I was saved, but from about 15 to 18, I was totally off focus. Mm -hmm. I was focusing on girls i was focusing on music i was focusing on everything so um, you were serving you were doing music in church yeah i was the worship leader but at the same time i was watching horror movies and doing uh -huh. porn and all kinds of stuff really so i know how to talk about hypocrisy because i was wow. a hypocrite wow. and then i remember one day when actually we won a contract with uh, a pretty big company and they said we're going to put all this money into you and you're going to be the next star and 
your team just won, your band just won this award. And I remember holding that contract in my hands. And what I realized when I held that contract was, okay, if I sign this thing, I'm going to fall off the deep end because at least I'm holding on to the church. At least I'm going to church. Mm -hmm. At least I'm serving. Yeah. But if I sign this contract, all of that is gone. And the Lord said three words to me as I'm holding that contract. He said, later, better, and different. And those three words completely transformed my life. Obviously, later is, it's not the time to do it, yeah. to do it right now. This is not the time. Mm -hmm. Better is, I've got a different plan for you. And different is... I'm going to make sure this all plays out correctly, but it's going to be different. It's going to be way out of what you thought was possible. So did you have like a radical encounter with the, with uh, Jesus? No, I, I didn't have a radical encounter with Jesus at that moment, but it was more like a slap in the face. Okay. And I think that you really have to have those moments where sometimes it's like, wake up. Did you have somebody uh, in your life that was there to guide you? Like and tell you, hey, this is not the right timing, or is this was this was all just personal uh, uh, like conversation with Jesus? You know, obviously, my mom was praying for me, my my dad's praying for me, yeah. but no, there wasn't a conversation per se that forced me to make a decision. Mm -hmm. But when I heard those words, I also heard that you've been idolizing your dream, and your dream has become your idol, and you have to take down the idol. And those three words, they completely shifted my life because I knew that I'd stopped doing music. I knew that I had to change all of my friends because my friends were all Christian, <laughs> but uh, they were not on fire for God. Yeah. And here's the thing, the devil, he has no authority. He can't stop you. But the only thing that he can do is he can get you off focus. Yeah. And so all of the stuff in my life that was happening was getting me off focus. And so there was a, a realignment that happened and I, I got rid of a lot of my friends. I started uh, completely changing what I listened to, what I watched, because I knew that what I was listening to and what I was watching was becoming my identity. Mm -hmm. And I just decided to be a so on fire for God. I said, I'll never do music ever again, because it's my idol. I'm going to go to Bible school and everything that was full of music that was full of my idol. Now I'm going to go fully after you. And there's one message that really, really impacted my life. And it wasn't like I'm falling on my face and chills are all over my body. It, it wasn't like that. And I don't think it always has to be like that. There's been plenty of moments like that, but this wasn't that. I was listening to it was one of those messages that it wasn't really dad preaching, but it was the Holy Spirit preaching through yeah, dad. I know. I know those moments. <laughs> and uh, he said a phrase that just wrecked me on the inside. And he was talking about your commitment to reading the word of God mm -hmm. and the word of God being the center of your life. Now, at this time, I hadn't read the word of God for two years because wow. every single time that I read the word, God would begin to speak into my life and tell me what to change. <laughs> and I was like, I don't want to hear that right now. Yeah. I'm kind of living my own life right now. And so what he said was, if you ate the way you read the Bible, what physical condition would you be in right now? And that hit me, hit me really hard. And I understood that I would be in the hospital with an IV up my arm, barely alive. And yeah. he said, there's a rule in my life has become my rule. No Bible, no food. So the first thing that my eyes see is the word of God. It's not a message on YouTube. Mm -hmm. It's not a worship song. It's the word of God. It's not Instagram or Facebook, right? Like no, first it's, thing, it's, it's first none thing of people that. that pull up in the morning, right? They open up their phones and and a lot of times the notifications try to take you there. Yeah. You're like, wait a minute, no, <laughs> I'm not going there. But you spend time in the word of God. You put the word of God first yeah. and you set up your day for success. 
Breakfast. And so spiritual breakfast. Yeah. You know, if I was to, you know, talk about an encounter, it was those moments. It was that moment with the contract where it said later, better and different. And it was mm-hmm. that message from my dad in church. I knew that I was messed up and I had to change. You know, a lot of people want to go through emotions. Oh, I want this experience with God. Yeah. And it's cool. It is. <laughs> but in a marriage, there's experiences. But what really builds the relationship is hard conversations. It's Difficult. when there's a sharpening, when it feels like there's Iron sparks sharpens. flying. Yeah. That is when a relationship is chiseled. I honestly had the same uh, similar situation, you know, like, because, uh, you know, I'm a PK, so a pastor's kid, right? Yeah. <laughs> I grew up in the church, you know, and uh, under the pews and always my dad would take me to every service every weekly service you know my dad was also a pastor and um I, and i remember just slowly slowly getting to know jesus i didn't have that radical encounter but i did have a point in my life when i was 16 when i was like okay i either have to do this or I, i'm not it's like go big or go home yeah 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 because i had i also was had bad friends in school and you know and they were always dragging me down but i always had that fear of the lord like in my life you know i was always afraid to mm-hmm. to to hurt god you know always afraid to to do something that would hurt his heart one of the things that i want to say about an encounter is i think a lot of people live off an encounter that they had when they were 15 when yeah. they were 16 and they're like oh that's the golden years yeah and they live off an old anointing but honestly i have an encounter with jesus every single morning come on yeah that's so good i don't have to go back to my 14 my 15 i treasure those moments i treasure moments when i laid on the floor and god god touched me but you can't live off an emotion yeah feelings emotions you have to live off what's on the inside of you what is revelation and your emotions will go against your revelation all the time yeah so it's about having that firm foundation and when there's that firm foundation you're set i know you're so, you wrote many songs i know you've uh, i've listened to your songs a lot actually and um I know that your songs blessed many people around the world, you know, and especially in the Slavic, Russian, Ukraine, you know, uh, a lot of people know your music. And um, so what is worship and how is it connected to the presence of the Lord? Well, honestly, when you go back to the garden, you go back to Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. They walked with God. They talked with God. There was a perfect communion and that is what worship is when you connect with god so it's not just uh singing on sundays no you know singing on sundays is great but your worship starts when you are alone and nobody sees you and you're just talking to your father and you're being strengthened in your identity of who you are who you are in him and who you serve because out of that comes your authority, but if you really want to get into what worship is from the Greek word proskuneo, which means to kiss. Yeah. Now, I kiss my wife differently <laughs> in my room with the door shut yeah. than I do, you know, just gently kissing her on the lips or, you know, even in the cheek at church. Because behind closed doors is where the transparency takes place. Also, if there's anybody who knows that I had a bad day, it's my wife. Because I can tell you, man, today has been awesome. But in reality, I'll go and talk to my wife and say, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. So there is transparency. There's nothing hidden. And worship is about transparency and not hiding anything. And one of the things that I love about David is the Psalms are just so full of transparency. It's almost like there's an alter ego in every single Psalm. You know, it's like, they're killing me. You've left me. Where are you? 
But then there's the next verse, but I will lift up my hands yeah. and I will praise you and I will give you glory. And you make me into a weapon to shake the nations. And then the next verse is, but I don't feel it right now. Where are you, God? You've left me there. David vicious. was going through the motions. Like there. he's just, <laughs> he's having this raw conversation with God. But worship is transparency and it's where you sit and you listen to him. And as you talk to him, he teaches you what to do and how to move and what to say. And so marriage, so marriage, it teaches you a lot about your relationship with Jesus. Absolutely. Or, or being, uh, I know you're a father as well. You have, uh, how many kids do you have? Two kids. Two kids, right? And I have two kids as well. And I know that like connection between you know, my kids and me, and it's, it really does represent um, the father, you know, like they, they do something bad, but I, I can't, like, I still love them, you know? And, oh yeah. And I always try to hug them, embrace them. And uh, it, family life really does teach you like about your relationship with the heavenly father. I was uh, talking to a pastor today. He was talking about, oh man, I just had my first kid. And I was taken back at that moment. Because I remember how in shock I was when I saw my first daughter, Amelia, I saw her and, you know, people talk about, oh, it's just such a beautiful experience and the baby is so beautiful. No, it's not beautiful. It's a cone head. There's blood. <laughs> there's a purple yeah. head. You know, there's yeah, blood yeah. veins that are all over the place. Yeah. It does not look cute. Yeah. But there is this weird feeling, overwhelming feeling that comes over you is that's not pretty. Yeah. She's not pretty, but I love her. Yeah. And she has done nothing for me, you know, for me love. to love her. She's yeah. done nothing. Yeah. And it's in that moment, you're like, wow, this is the way God sees us. Yeah. Because we don't look pretty, but because wow. we are his, he looks us and he says, wow. So good. He says, you've done nothing for me to love you, but because you're mine, I just love you. And I don't care if you're really messed up right now. I see you the way you're supposed to be. I see you in my eyes, which is, I see you as a conqueror. I see you as a warrior. I see you as someone who, who carries my inheritance. I see you, I see you as my kid. You know, I, I know that, that as a father, somebody tries to mess with my kids. Uh, you're not going to get love from me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you're going to get, <laughs> you're going to get a courageous yeah. roar. <laughs> yeah. And that's what God does for us. Yeah. And going back to worship, when you worship him, you realize who he is as a loving father. You also realize that he is the courageous father, the warrior going after you, yeah. the teacher, all of this. And when you worship him, you're shifting the atmosphere. You're working together with him to yeah. change things. Yeah. And they're changed in the spirit first yeah. with your relationship with him. And is, is, that, is that why do you, are you going on the streets and preaching and singing to the people because some people are wondering why are you doing that phil like why are you out there on Times square with a guitar singing like is it is somebody paying you or or do you just love jesus that much or is this is that your calling or what's the deal that comes directly from my relationship with god yeah and the only authority that i have to do that when demons are cast out when legs grow out when I mean, there's one miracle that I was just so shocked and in awe about. And that was when we were worshiping at Ground Zero. Mm -hmm. And there were all these people. The Ground Zero, that's when, where the Twin Towers were, Yeah, right? that's where the Twin Towers yeah. fell. And so it's uh, the memorial for 9-11. And so there's all these people at one side. And I think logically that seems like the great place to go because people are going to be impacted by the presence of God. Yeah, people from all over the world go to see that, that, that place, right? But there's another side that is empty. 
And the Lord says, go to that side. And a lot of times what God says to you doesn't make a ton of sense, but you just got to go with it. You got to flow with it. Yeah. And there was a lot of instruction. Philip, I need you to start with God bless America. Then you're going to go into worship. And um, as we're doing that, there's this Hispanic guy. And his eyes are wide open. His mouth is wide open. He is in complete shock. Something is happening to him. We're not even plugged in. It's all acoustic. And one of my evangelists walks up to him. His name's Kenneth, phenomenal man of God. Walks up to him and says, did you know that God loves you? And he has a great plan for your life. Mm -hmm. And he says, yes. Can I pray for you? He says, yes, but I don't understand English. <laughs> I no understand English. I no speak English. So how I understand you now. And it was enough. So basically what happened is God gave that man the ability to speak and understand the English language for about three minutes so he could give his life to the Lord. And those are the moments. I mean, I live for those moments. I live for the presence, for yeah. the stuff that happens behind doors. Do you receive some kind of joy or satisfaction? Like, Well, the Bible says preaching salvation is the power of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to see how God comes alive in your life, go preach. Yeah. And you don't have to do it like I do. You can do it on social media or you can do it at your work yeah. or you can do it at school. It doesn't matter. But when you open your mouth, you are stepping into that unknown. Yeah. And when you step into that unknown, then God can teach you and say, okay, I'm going to take you a little deeper right now. Yeah. And there's a mystery in that. It's like when I was teaching my daughter how to swim, she was freaked out you know, when I told her to go deeper. <laughs> you know, when she could feel the bottom, uh, things were good. Safe place. A safe place. But as soon as she couldn't feel the bottom anymore, even though she had her floaties on, even though daddy was right there, she's like, what's happening? I don't know. I don't know. But that's when you have to trust that dad's, he's right there. Yeah. So preaching. So let go. Let go of the bottom and allow me to lead you and direct you. Yeah. And when you're out on the streets and when you're doing things, we've seen about a thousand people receive the Lord on the streets, transgenders, gays, lesbians, voodoo priests. I mean, cops that should have shut us down, but <laughs> they were in tears and said, you can continue. Demon possessed people getting set free. Just amazing. And, and places where, like, legitimately, people say, oh, we've been there before. We've been there before. And, uh, and we almost got beat to death in the gay district in San Francisco, the, the Castro district. And you're going to go there and you're going to fail. Because that's the deep. Because <laughs> so that's... What happened to so them? The church is the safe place. What you're trying to say is it's the safe place. Yeah. Once we start to step out and go to the streets or even start to preach at your job or at college or school, that's when you're in the deep. That's when you're in the deep, but also you can take it into a place of, you know, when the Lord tells you to give. Mm, that's actually And you're cool. like, God, I don't have any money to give. It's... I don't have anything to give, but he's like, give, and then God will bless you. Yeah, and me and my wife, we, we've been there many times where we're in this financially hard situation and logic, what it would cause you to do is hold on to all your money, make sure that you spend wisely. Be safe. Be yeah. safe. But what God is saying is, I don't want your feet to touch the ground. I know, man. I've been there many times as well. <laughs> I want you to let me carry you. Yeah. And when I say give, you give. And so God begins to teach you, whether it's in evangelism or it's in 
finances, or it's in learning how to uh, build your marriage and say, man, she's mad at me and I don't know why and I don't know how this happened. God, can you please just help me out a little bit? Yeah. Even and if it takes even if it takes you to go apologize. Yeah. <laughs> though you're well, not wrong. <laughs> I believe that you should always apologize. But I mean, in that arena, I mean, it's better to say I'm sorry and not lose the day. Even if you truly believe that you're not sorry, say sorry. Yeah. And that's also letting go of your feet and allowing God to teach you to swim in the deep. Wow. So good, man. And so it's not just in evangelism. It's in every single area of life, whether it's in business or it's in school. It's letting go of the way you see something, your plan, and just allowing God to move through you and letting him take your hand and say, okay, let go of the bottom. I've got you. Do you really got me? I've got you. I'm like right here. And it's a place of faith. And that's where you grow. And that's where God stretches you. But in regards to evangelism, honestly, the darkness is not timid at all. They're not timid in TikTok. They're not timid in YouTube shorts. Timid in... uh, the gay agenda, the lesbian agenda, changing the definition of a man or a woman. They're not timid. And they speak about it with such confidence that if you don't have God in your life, you're going to believe it. Oh, yeah. Because there is such confidence in the way it is spoken that this is what we live for. Well, what if the church took its positioning and instead of being timid about righteousness was ferocious? Yeah. about righteousness. And that's why the Lord has given me the word shock the darkness, which means that we go to the places the where places. Christians are not there and we shock the darkness unannounced. Wow. We show up and God starts moving. Come on. That's so good. And so many times, like my team will ask me, they'll say, Philip, what are we doing today? And it's before we take communion together. And I'll say, Honestly, I have no idea what we're doing today. I know we're going out, but don't ask me about locations and times and everything because I don't know. But after communion, I will know. I will have a plan. And that's exactly the way it was in New York, in every park, near the strip bar. I mean, it was was led by Holy Spirit. And there is such a such a joy in being led by Holy Spirit. Would you say um, that's your calling to go and preach? My calling is to show everyone who the Father is, show His love. And that's what Jesus said. Doesn't matter where you are. It's like, I have come to show who my Father is. Holy Spirit, the same power that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead is on the inside of me. So our calling is to reveal Jesus and reveal the Father to the world. And if you're in sports, do it in sports. If you're in ministry, do it in ministry, but do it courageously. I know like a lot of young people, um, they, they quite don't understand sometimes when you say go and preach or go, uh, go to the streets or, you know, you got to preach all the time. Like they, they, they don't know what that means. Um, is for you personally, like, do you, do you always preach or do you like, do you always go evangelize? I know because you have a family, right? You have a church. Where is the balance? Like, is there some kind of balance in your life? What goes well, first? There has to be a balance. What goes first for you? Like family? first is my relationship with God. Mm-hmm. Like I tell my wife, I love God more than you. I tell my kids, I love your mom more than I love you because you're going to leave the house and we're going to stay together. (laughs) So there has to be a balance. And that balance, sometimes, although they they kind of intertwine a little bit or um, 
life will try to force them to be intertwined is, is this is the mystery and, and this is how we're supposed to reveal it. It's God first, your relationship with God, Mm-hmm. And your relationship with God is not ministry. Okay. So it's your relationship with God. That means you and God together. Personal time. Personal time with God. That is number one. That's where everything grows. and Everything grows from out of that. And then there's family. And if you neglect your first ministry, which is your family, then you really can't minister to the, to the world because you're neglecting your first responsibility. Yeah. And this is so, so important. And so God will not release you into the ministry until you are faithful with your family. And what happens is when people get that messed up and they go into ministry before their family is in a good spot, their family falls apart. Yeah. And that is not God's plan. But a lot of times, I take my family with me. That's so good. Because when you read the Word of God and you read, you read um, Leviticus, for instance. Leviticus is all about the priests and all about the Levites and all about the responsibilities in the temple. It's all about families. And the families ministered together as one. Because when you go into the ministry... That doesn't mean forsake your family. You're going to lose everything. There's a lot of PKs, you know, pastor's kids that have fallen away from God because dad put ministry first and family was second. Well, and so now they've fallen away from God. They don't like God because God is the one who stole our family. Took dad away from the family. Took dad away from me. And there has to be a balance. Yeah, so so did you have a great example in your family uh, how to balance that or you just uh, learned that on your own? There's definitely been some adjustments that I've understood on my own. And I'm doing things a little bit differently than my dad did. Mm -hmm. As every family should, you can't be a copy of your dad. Yeah. Because you are you. You have your own footprint. You have your own fingerprint. You're going to do things a little bit differently. But dad would take us on trips. And I remember the first time that I went on a trip with my dad. And um, he was praying for somebody. And he laid hands on them. And they went out under the power of God. (laughs) And uh, I was talking to my dad. And I go, Dad, why are you punching people? (laughs) Like, that's not cool. Aren't you supposed to be full of love? (laughs) Why are you punching people? He's like, no, Philip, when I pray for them, the power of God comes on them. And because the power of God is so powerful, the presence is too powerful for our bodies. And so sometimes, you know, we can't control the way our bodies react. So that's why some people shake. That's why some people cry. That's why some people fall down. But even then, he explained to me, talking about the relationship with father and son, Mm -hmm. like the father will teach you through worship. He explained to me that if they just fall down, that doesn't mean that their life was transformed. (laughs) Yeah. If you shake, great. But it's what happens to you after you shake, after you fall down, after the tears. Because if you're just looking for another shake or another fall down or another emotional thing, but you don't change your life, you have just turned a service of revival into religion. Because that's what religion is. It's a lot of emotions with no action, no transformation. Yeah. That's what my dad taught me. And I learned that on the trip. And then when I would come home, you know, he would talk to me about what happened from his trip or from that trip or when he would come home from yeah. a trip and we hadn't seen him for a long time. He would, he would play with us and, and uh, so I he think we call it rocket. 
But he definitely set a great example for you. Yeah. And my mom too. Um, I never heard one time from my mom, uh, oh, I can't stand it. Dad's gone so much. We're by ourselves again. She never complained. She understood. You know, yeah. mom, she set the tone. Now, she, was she in ministry as well? Yeah, of course. I mean, because she's my, my dad's wife. Yeah. So she's, she's traveling with dad and okay. she's a pastor in the church and all of that. But she understood, especially in the early years, she has to set the tone in the house. And so I love ministry a lot because of my mom. And because when my mom, I never heard my mom complain. I never heard my mom go against my father. My mom sang me songs when I was young and sang over me. It's like, Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds. And nothing I desire compares with you. And I can remember, you know, her pleading the blood over me before I went to sleep. Said, God's going to speak to you through your dreams. God is going to use you, your leader. Wow. And so she created the atmosphere in the home. Wow. That's so beautiful. Dad was the leader of the home, but mom cultivated the atmosphere. Wow. And that's a big reason why I love the Lord right now is because I was cultivated in a good atmosphere. And something I want to speak to, to pastors right now, people who are watching right now, I never heard any gossip. I didn't hear the word divorce. Yeah. I didn't hear, oh, this worship leader just bad mouth this guy and you know, this person is spreading lies about the church. And I wasn't a part of those conversations. I'm sure those conversations happened. I know they happened. But dad and mom said, I need you to go to the other room right now. We're having an adult talk right now. Yeah. And they shielded me from what could have destroyed my love for God, my love for the church. And my love for the calling that he's given me. So beautiful. That's a great example, I think, for a lot of the young couples, a lot of the young women of, of God, you know, like a lot of the young wives and moms, you know. That's, uh, I definitely see, I, I saw that throughout my life as well. Yeah. Uh, my mom did exactly the same thing, you know. She sang the songs. She, I remember a lot, a lot of times where my dad would come home from work late, tired and my mom was be like ivan grab the guitar we're gonna practice a kid's song right now so they could perform at church and my dad would play the guitar and he would fall asleep while playing the guitar you know i just remember that dedication you know and a mom always you know she she definitely did all the work you know because as dads you know we're we're busy we're we're providing for the family you know we're we're taking care of the kids and the finances, you know, and we're a team. And one thing that I really want to say, because I didn't think we'd go into marriage, but, you know, worship is not just on the stage. It's not just in reading your Bible. Your life is a representation of worship to God. Wow. So the way you work so you is going to be stage. worship to God. Yeah. The way you sing is going to be worship to God. The way you do sports is going to be worship to God. Paul says, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord, which means do it as worship. Do it to honor him. And so in marriage, we're supposed to do it as unto the Lord. And one of the things that I've heard, you know, spoken quite a bit is, you know, behind every great man is a powerful woman of God. <laughs> and I don't agree with that statement <laughs> because it's not behind, it's beside. Oh, okay. That's good. Many times the woman is behind, like my dreams are behind. You know, it's all about, always about the man. It's always about uh, the man's dream, the man's 
vision, but you know, maybe when he's dead, I can start dreaming. <laughs> and that's the way it is sometimes in families. I don't mean to be like yeah. graphic and real, but yeah, I mean, this is real. And there's a lot of women, wives that do not have their dreams realized because it's all about the man. And I don't believe that that's a biblical picture because even when you study the word, you know, the Bible says that it's about Christ and it's about the bride. Of course, Christ is in front, but it also says as Christ loved the church, died for the church, so yeah. a man should love and die yeah. for his wife, which means that a man should sometimes die to his dreams so that his wife's dreams can be wow. realized. That's definitely a, a new and good perspective. I like that. You know, I don't think that's popular. <laughs> I know it's not popular, but it's, I believe it's the word. Yeah. And you want to have a successful marriage and you, you want to love each other even after your kids leave the house? Because a lot of parents, they live for their kids. Yeah, that's wrong. And then when the kids are gone, they're like, I don't even know you. Yeah. And then things begin <clears throat> to fall apart. But even the way you live your marriage is worship to God. We must live it in a way that is honoring to him. Let's go into something completely different. <laughs> <laughs> We're not planning to talk about marriage. And, but no, but it's, it's, it's a form of it's, worship. Yeah, Everything that you do in life is a form of worship. Yeah. Because it's, it's honoring God. Yeah. I want to ask a question um, more to, about music. Um, what is music to you? I know if we look at the Bible, music is very connected to worship. I heard one preacher say a very interesting thought. He said the he said that um, music is the only tool or a heavenly element that's used on earth. So we imagine that there's music in heaven 24-7, right? Um, I constantly think of that. Like, I, you know, it, when I'm singing worship at even at home on my guitar or at church, I'm thinking about the angels singing, holy, holy, yeah. the Lord God Almighty. And I and tell God that, never gets tired of that word. Yeah. And I tell that to my team all the time. If you have hard time, um, focusing on worship, just just think of the heaven. Like, what's going on in heaven right now? Well, I mean, I think it's it's when God created me. It says that He knew you. That's Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. Yeah, I knew you. I have the plans for you. That word to know is to know intricately every single part of your life, your thoughts, what you're gonna do, the way you look, how many hairs are on your head. Yeah. All of that, your, your body type, yeah. your blood type, everything to intricately know. And so God chose music for me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's why it's music, but music is powerful. And music is the international language. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. you don't understand that language, but you can bob your head to that. Baseline, <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> talking to a bass player. <laughs> I mean, when a drummer and a bass player are playing together, it's like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, this is good. Yeah. And you don't have to know the language that they're speaking because music, especially when you're plucking the guitar or you're playing the piano, it's like you're plucking different strings of the soul, which is why it is so important the kind of music that you play. I mean, you can play major and everybody be happy. <laughs> you can play minor and get into some, you know, sometimes dark stuff. And it's going to be, it's not really going to be very happy. Yeah. But then you can mix them and, you know, there's different. I love minor. For me, minor is like war. Like yeah. We're in war right now. Like, like Lion, you know? Yeah, like, like Lion, <laughs> um, like some other songs. Um, there's a place for that. Worship is not always about war. Worship is also about victory. And so you're plucking the strings of the soul. And when you touch the right string, you can transform somebody's life, which is why 
music is anointed. It's it's why you can you can play E minor and you know there's rock groups, very bad rock groups that start with E minor, <laughs> and people will go and commit suicide after wow. their concert. But then you can take the same E minor and you can sing. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And it's the same E minor, but there's a different spirit to it. Anointing. There's an anointing. And there is an anointing from the devil. Really? And there is an anointing from heaven. And everything that the devil learned, he learned from heaven. Because he was in the manifest presence of God. And when you study it out, I mean, he was he was part of the music. Yeah. I mean, he was basically the worship leader. He was a musical instrument. He much. was a musical instrument. Yeah. So he understands the principles of music and the power of music, which is why he uses music to yeah. start wars, to bring chaos, to change identity, to bring destruction. Music is powerful. Yeah. And it's all about the anointing that you put in the music, which is why it's, it's super important what music you listen to because there's been some uh, instrumental music that I'm like, man, that is so cool and that is so deep. But then I feel the Holy Spirit say, that is so wrong. <laughs> like they've been somewhere. They've been somewhere in the wrong spirit when they got that chord, when they got that melody, they've been somewhere. And even the rock bands of, I believe it was ACDC, don't quote me on that, but it was one of those rock mm -hmm. bands that even in their lyrics, they said, we woke up in the morning and there was a black figure smiling at us. Huh. And it was when the black figure was in the room Those that demonic. we received the revelation or the download wow. to create this song. And I mean, you can you can study it. I mean, you can look. That's it. definitely not Jesus. It's not Jesus, <laughs> but yeah. it's taken directly from the Bible. Wow! Because Psalm seventeen verse fifteen says, "The righteous will see my face." They will wake up in the morning. Mm. They will see me and they will be satisfied. It's one of the scriptures I quote almost every single day. It's like, Lord, I want to see you today. I want to see you move today. My soul is going to be satisfied. So you can see that even the lyrics of that song and what happened to them to get their download, their evil download, is directly from Psalm 17, 15. Yeah. So everything that the devil does is a cheap counterfeit yep. of the presence of God. And we can get on our knees and cry out to God, and he can show us the sounds and the melodies that will shift the atmosphere. Wow. So through all of this, when we talk about the anointing, what is music? The point of music is to reveal Jesus to the world. And what does the devil do? He takes it and creates a cheap counterfeit of it to reveal the devil to the world because he's full of pride and he's about himself. Yeah, It's all about revealing to the world who the devil is and how much power he has. The yeah. Bible says in Isaiah, at the end of the age, the kings of the world will see him. They will see the devil and they'll be in shock and they'll say, is this the one that held the whole world and deceived the entire earth? Wow. This is the one. And so we are to reveal Jesus to the world through music and bring the manifest presence of Jesus. And Jesus will reveal the heavenly father to the world. And it's so beautiful. So this is a little bit of a controversial question, but um, worship music and show business. Uh, where do we draw the line 
Mm-hmm. Uh, can can you be a worship leader on a Sunday, and then uh, be an entertainer entertainer on a Saturday, for instance? As long as you're showing Jesus wherever you go, mm-hmm. you can't have a double standard. There's been lots of examples that people have just crashed and burned because in church they were showing one representation. I mean, a hypocrite, and I was one. I was one of those people because in church, when I was 15 through 18, I led worship. And I told people, raise your hands. God is in this place. But then I'd go home and I'd watch horror movies that have every kind of evil in them. And of course, my dad didn't know and nobody knew. And it was all, it was my secret sin. But you can't be in two places at the same time and have a double standard. Mm -hmm. That is what destroys church, is double standards. You know, I believe that music, if you, if you look at music, even in the world, and if you look at music in the church, the songs that really touch are not songs that people said, okay, let's get together and let's write this hit. <laughs> no, they're songs that have a story behind them. They're songs that have the ability to pluck the soul because they were not taught, they were caught. When you get a song from God that is caught and it can minister to the world, go for it. Because when you get a song that is caught in worship, caught in the presence of God, and it doesn't have Jesus in every single chorus, but the center of the song is about your relationship with God, Since it's been caught in the presence, it will minister to others and it will bless them and will take them out of dark places. Well, that's good. But you can't live and have a double standard. Going into worship, as a worship leader, how do you get the church to respond to the worship song, for instance? It's a long conversation, but there are commands in the Bible and it's not a command if you feel like it raise your hands. It's not, if you feel like it, fall on your knees. Those are commands. When the Lord directs me to tell people, raise your hands, to tell people, lift up a shout of praise. I wrote a whole book on it. It's called Worship Without Limits. You can find it on Amazon. But there are times and there are practical things that you can do to lead a congregation I've led congregations that are not charismatic whatsoever, (laughs) but at the end of the service, they were shouting. And at the end of the service, they were lifting their hands. And at the end of the service, they were up at the front and we were laying hands on them and God was moving. Praise God. And people would say, this never happens in this church. It's not just the Holy Spirit came into the room. The Holy Spirit did come into the room, but there's also practical things that you do to cause people to grow and stretch their faith. Like some people, they don't want to raise their hands. Well, I will give them a 30 second reason to raise their hands. Your hands represent your life. Your hands represent your pluses, your minuses, your downfalls, your victories. And so I'll say, just lift up your hands, lift it all to Jesus. And then Someone has the understanding that, okay, this is not just something that we do to be traditional when we raise our hands. This is actually a form of worship, and I'm giving myself to God. A sign of surrender. And then you can go to Psalm 144, verse 1, which it says that my hands are weapons of war. Oh, wow. So when you lift up your hands, you shift the atmosphere. And I'll tell people. You know, maybe you don't feel like lifting your hands, but God is in this room right now and you begin to shift the atmosphere and you begin to shift the situation when you lift your hands. And so there's a teaching moment. Now, I won't go there unless the Holy Spirit really tells me to go there. It's stuff that works 
but it's not like a formula. You only go there if the Lord really told you to go yeah. there. And so without Holy Spirit, this doesn't work. And people won't follow you unless you have been on your face before the Lord before. Because people can spot a fake. And when they realize that you're an actor, they're not going to follow you. So it honestly all goes back to the presence of God. Where are you in your relationship with God? Because people are going to see who you are on stage. You're not going to be yeah. able to hide the fact that you're faking it. We have a lot of that. I feel like we have a lot of that in, in the churches nowadays. A lot of performers, a lot of fake. I think people are tired of that. I think people want the true thing, the true worship. I think it's time for, for the church, for the worship industry for the worship leaders to go back to the heart of worship absolutely um i don't I, this is going to be weird but would you mind sharing a song with us sure can we grab the guitar i feel like even the people that are watching right now uh i pray that through this song they experienced the love of god and the presence of god so this is a song that actually came Two days ago and it's interesting how the lord leads you because i was quoting the scriptures and i was lifting up my hands in the morning and i wasn't even really preparing for service i was just spending time with god and that is where the overflow is yeah you can't spend time with god to get something You spend time with God to know him. And when you know him, then comes the overflow. Yes. And so this is a song that I never sang anywhere. <laughs> I might mess it up as we're going. Okay. But, uh, and I'm only going to sing just, just a little bit. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Uh, and I'm not really going to belt out or anything like that. <laughs> But we're just going just gonna to kind of ease our way into it. You take my breath away You take my breath away You take my breath away I worship you You take my breath away You take my breath away How beautiful you are I stand in awe of you You take my breath away You take my breath away You take my breath away I worship you You take my breath away You take my breath away How beautiful you are I stand in awe of you, God In all of you, God. In all of you, God. In all of you, I stand in all. Beautiful. Well, I just want to say thank you so much, Philip, for blessing us with this beautiful song. And thank you for finding the time to be with us. And to our viewers, to our watchers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, feel free to comment, like, subscribe, and we're going to see you in the future. May God bless you. And Philip, do you want to say something? Amen. You know, let's pray together. Father, I thank you for everyone. Everyone. They're your children. They are full of the power of God, the glory of God. 
I thank you for every pastor. I thank you for every pastor's kid. I thank you for every single person that is watching right now who has a dream, but it feels like that dream has been aborted. God right now is bringing resurrection power to your life, and he's been speaking to you through this program. He's been speaking to you through this conversation. And it's all about giving your life back to Jesus. It's all about making him number one in your life. And like we were talking about before, just allowing him to be daddy and trusting him, even if it feels like you're in the deep end, but just trusting him and saying, I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I know who holds tomorrow, and that's you. That's you, Jesus. So, Father, right now, we speak to all of the aborted dreams, and we destroy, through the blood of Jesus, every single lie of the enemy. We speak life where there was death. We speak words of encouragement where people spoke words of gossip and destruction. And we speak the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, that the cross has the final word. It's not what your friends said. It's not what your dad said. It's not what your past said. The cross, that in the cross, we are made perfect through him, through the blood. We are made perfect through him. When we remember what he has done and worship him, it just takes our breath away. And we stand in awe and we worship him. So, Father, I thank you that wherever they are right now, you encounter them with your love, with your power, with your glory. In the name of Jesus, amen.